If you need a handout sheet, just lift your hand right up and the ushers will see that you receive one. Of course, it's right in our prayer sheet as well. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to be working a little bit outside the uh, study sheet some uh, this evening, especially in the first part of the lesson. Um, I've been giving out the handout sheets and then I've sort of been adding to it as uh, things progress. It's interesting to me, too, that uh, as I've mentioned, there's 31 chapters, and uh, one of the good habits to get into is to try to read one chapter a day out of the book of Proverbs. And of course, this being December the 1st, this gives you an opportunity to get started right here uh, this month to uh, read one chapter a day. And I would say this, that even if you would get in the habit of reading a chapter a day, even if you don't know the reference and the the, uh, chapter and the verse, Uh, the Word of God will begin to dwell in your mind and heart, and then you'll be able to really bring that up at some of the most interesting times. There have been times in the uh, time that I've been talking to people, soul winning and whatnot, where uh, then the Lord just bring a verse of Scripture to mind. And I'm sure He does that for you as well. But there's power about just spending some time in the Word of God on a regular basis. And you know I've said this before that Uh, Someone said when I first got saved that if I would read five chapters a day in Psalms and one chapter in Proverbs and one chapter in the book of Acts, uh, Psalms deals with our relationship with God, Proverbs our relationship with man, and of course uh, Acts is a motivational book, then uh, that sort of gives you a well-rounded opportunity to uh, get something from the Lord. And then he said you spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament, a little bit of time in the New Testament. I know when I talk like that, people say, well, you know, Pastor, I work 40 hours or 50 hours a week and whatnot. I don't have time to read that much. You'd be surprised how little time it really takes. If you would just time yourself sometime, even reading out loud conversationally, you could read a lot of Scripture in a short period of time. So don't let the devil or the weakness of the flesh keep you out of the Word of God. Amen? You want to stay in the Word and let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. It's also interesting, last week we went through chapter 5 dealing with the morality. And then of course you get into chapter 6 and the first 19 verses of Scripture really deal with uh, somewhat of a a different uh, emphasis. The first five verses of Scripture talks about being a surety which we'll look at in just a moment. Then you get into chapter 6 and verse 20 all the way through chapter 7 and it deals once again in morality. You'll find that many times that if you're not right in your sexual morals, then you're not going to be right in the way you handle your money and your business dealings either. It's sort of like a two-edged sword there. And so you want to be careful that as we look here in the book of Proverbs that we pay special attention to the entire Word of God to be sure, but especially when you see these opening verses as Solomon is talking to his son and laying that foundation for us. You know the book of Proverbs is really split up into three sections and so it's really interesting how Solomon talking to his son, trying to give him some helps in life, what all he emphasizes in these early chapters. So I'd like to begin by reading the first five verses of Scripture of Proverbs chapter 6. He says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids, Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. On your study sheet it says, number one, integrity. Letter A says, God puts a great deal of emphasis on integrity. And integrity is honesty. And you know, that's something that we find missing today. In many uh, avenues of work, especially in life, uh, and you find that many times in the business community. I've actually had people say, well, you know, church is one thing and work is another. And they try to categorize, but I like what a preacher of the past said. He said, to a Christian, there's no difference between the secular and the sacred. All ground is sacred ground in the life of the believer. 
And when it comes to our business dealings, we need to be people that can be trusted on. Uh, there has been quite a time in many communities where many businessmen who deal a lot with Christians would say, boy, you know, I find that Christians many times are crooks. I remember talking to a banker in this town, the town of Winkler, and his wife was saved and we tried leading him to the Lord for a number of years. But I remember sitting not too far from here in his living room and uh, he told me that he didn't want to accept Christ as Savior. And we got to talking about that. And he mentioned how, number one, Hollywood always portrays a, a preacher as some bumbling idiot. And then also, not only Hollywood, but he said, I do a lot of the banking around here with a lot of the people in the community. And I see the way they handle their money. He says, I'm not interested. And I never could talk to that man about his soul and get anywhere. And as far as I know, he's probably in hell tonight because he never accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. That's quite an indictment on Christianity. So sometimes we wonder why God might put some of the uh, warnings and some of these principles in his word that we sometimes would say, well, you know, you, we ought to just take that for granted. And yet we can't take it for granted. And uh, we need to understand that the integrity is so important in our business dealings. And so God puts a great deal of emphasis on integrity, and integrity is honesty. Letter B, these first five verses have to do with business dealings. We've already looked at a couple passages that deal, dealt with having a just weight, and how that in that agricultural society they would weigh out the grain for people, and the Lord was very conscious of the fact that some people would misweigh the, uh, the, the, the crop so that they could take advantage of the sale that was being made. And so he, the Lord says, I hate that kind of dishonesty. And so you and I as believers ought to go that extra mile to provide things honest in the sight of all men. Letter C, if you all have already made a contract, co-signed a loan or pledged yourself, you are to keep your word. That's vital, you have to keep your word. And it even says you swear to your own hurt. And uh, these sometimes are hard things because it's uh, positions of integrity like this that many times uh, slip first in our dealings. And uh, when there's backsliding that takes place, many times we just sort of uh, walk that line, so to speak. And we need to be very, very careful in our business dealings. And so if you have already made a contract, co-signed a loan, or pledged yourself, you are to keep your word. However, you may appeal to the person you pledge for nullification. I have to put that in there. Some people say, and you know, I, I've heard people say this, well, they'll make a, a promise to a friend, and that friend is getting ready to do something wrong, or they're not doing something honestly, but because you gave your word, you don't want to break your word to this so-called friend, and so you will let them do whatever they're going to do and keep that under wraps. Uh, number one, that's disobedience to Scripture. Uh, but at the same time, you are to, uh, in a business deal like this, if you find yourself that you have overpromised or that you shouldn't have gotten into that contract or that partnership, you ought to go to them and say, what do I have to do to get out of this particular arrangement that we have? And try to work that out. And if they say there's nothing you can do, then you need to keep your word. Well, you say, well, they don't keep their word, but you can still keep your word. And so, you know, it's amazing. You even get to the marriage altar and you say, you know, I promise this and I promise that till death do us part. And nowadays we live in a society where your word really doesn't matter that much. In fact, that's why they have these prenuptial agreements. It's almost like, well, let's go ahead and make a prenuptial agreement because we're not really going to honor our word anyway. We want to have this out clause and so on. Christians ought not operate that way. We ought to keep our word. And so we see here, letter D, a good process to follow in these types of situations is as follows. Number one, do not make the promise to begin with. People say, well, you know, you should never make a promise. Well, of course you should make a promise. God makes promises all the time. But you know what? He's faithful and he keeps his word. And you know, he swears to his own hurt, if I can say it that way. What do I mean by that? I just say, well, you've got to do it and how to take advantage of it. Uh, that's a good time to say no. 
And uh, even if you come back later and realize, boy, I could have made a ton of money. Well, that still doesn't mean that that deal was for you if you can't have the time to pray about it. Remember, there was the Gibeonites, I believe it was in uh, Judges chapter 6, no, Joshua chapter 6, where the children of Israel made a promise to the Gibeonites without seeking counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And because of that, uh, they realized that, uh uh-oh, we've been deceived. Some of the people said, you know, let's go ahead and kill these people. God told us to wipe out everybody in the land and take possession of the land. And then uh, the Lord says, no, 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 no. You made, your, you, you made a promise to them that you would not, we, you've got to honor your word, but just know this, they're going to be a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. And many times we have to live through the consequences of prior decisions because we didn't ask counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And so in other words, we ought to be praying about everything. Every decision we make, every place we go, we ought to be bathing that in prayer and say, Lord, is this for me? You say, but it's such a good deal. It may not be the deal for you, though. It may be a good deal for someone else, but not for you. And so you have to make sure that you get clearance from God first. And so you always consult the Lord first. Number three, if you find you have made an unwise decision, understand that it was your decision and you may have to carry it through. You know, that's why they say that business partnerships are so uh, dangerous because when one uh, partner makes a decision, the other one is also obligated to fulfill that decision and uh, that meet that obligation. And you hear the horror stories of one business partner going out and spending a lot of money and then the other partner getting stuck with the bill. And so you, there's a lot of wisdom that Solomon has given to his son here. And there's a lot of wisdom that needs to be enacted in the church of Jesus Christ and our personal lives as well in regard to this surety ship that's talked about in this passage of scripture. So if you find that you've made an unwise decision, you have to take ownership of that decision. We like playing the blame game. You know, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and the serpent didn't have anybody to blame. But at the same time, you see, we always wanna pass that buck to someone else And we have to take ownership of our own mistakes, our own sins, our own rash decisions, and then we have to go through the consequences at times. But like I said a couple weeks ago when we were looking at uh, Psalm 51, when David said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Well, when you do that, it says, then will I teach what? Sinners thy ways. And so as you learn things in life, it's all the promise. That's what it says here. It says, um, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, verse 3, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Number five, your friendship is more important than money or things. God always puts the person above the program. God always puts the, per, uh, puts the person above the program. I want to uh, just uh, back up just a little bit, and I want to deal a little bit more with this aspect of surety or suretyship. And I went through the book of Proverbs and other portions of Scripture and just sort of looked at this entire subject matter over. Because we do live in a complicated society. And a lot of things are intertwined today It's a lot more complicated than what maybe we find ourselves just even 50 to 100 years ago. And so the strong defines surety as the action of giving a pledge or a guarantee. The action of giving a pledge or guarantee. A dictionary definition is uh, security against loss or damage or or for the fulfillment of an obligation, the payment of a debt, It's also defined as a pledge, a guarantee, or a bond. And this is another uh, dictionary definition. A person who has made himself or herself responsible for another as a sponsor, as the dictionary says, a godparent or a bondsman. This is presenting yourself as a surety that you stand for someone else. And I would say that... uh, 
a great illustration for a surety ship for one person to another person. If you want to write down in your notes, Genesis chapter 43 and verse 9, you have Judah who actually told his father Israel, Jacob, that he would be a surety for, uh, or what we would say collateral for his brother Benjamin as they would go down to see Joseph. You remember they'd gone down and Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers didn't recognize him. And of course they kept back one of the brothers and Judah went back to his dad and his dad was broken hearted about this. And so we find here that Judah is saying, I will become surety. In other words, he was telling his dad that he would stand instead and he would be the collateral that was needed to assure that uh, Benjamin would be okay. Then in Genesis chapter 44 and verse 32, we have Judah explains the surety that he presented to his dad Israel uh, for uh, Benjamin. And so it's, so, uh, it's important to, uh, for us to realize uh, that he stood in place as collateral. In other words, there's uh, the business aspect of being a surety, but there's also promises that are made in regards for one person to another. And what I mean by that, and what I'm, the emphasis I'm trying to make here is it's important for us to keep our word. And in this day and time, that's why you go to the bank if you try to buy a house and you've got an inch thick pad of uh, papers to sign because people have a way of not keeping their word. And so the organization, the bank, or the loaning institution is going to tie you up as much as possible so that they can guarantee if you don't keep your word, they're still gonna get their material. They're gonna get their house back, their car back, or whatever it is. And so that's why it's so important for us in our testimony to keep our word, to make sure that we honor uh, and keep and pay our debts. And so it's very important to understand suretyship and the safety net and the admonition and warnings and encouragement that God has given us here in the book of Proverbs. Let me say this, number one in this aspect from Proverbs 6, 1, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. And I say this, when you give your word to a friend or one you do not know really well, you are to keep your word. I think one thing you're gonna get from this lesson is we're to keep our word, <laughs> okay? And so it's interesting here, it says your friend, but also with a stranger. Now, stranger to know the right definition, you have to look at it as a context. Uh, in chapter five, when it talks about a strange woman, it was talking about a woman that's not your wife. That's the strange woman. It doesn't mean weird woman. And then when it talks about here in chapter six, when it says, if thou stri uh, stricken thy hand with a stranger, it's not talking about a weird one. It's talking about one that you don't really know that well. And so you stand up for them in a business deal and whatnot. He says, no, you need to understand you're to keep your word. If you go that direction, if you give your word, you keep your word, even if in the end you end up realizing the one you made a promise about is not gonna keep their word, which then that one can come to you and say, you need to pay this debt. When you co-sign for someone, they don't pay that debt, then that person who, who gave that product then can come to you and collect the balance of that debt. So number two, if you co-sign or pledge yourself to something with another you don't really know, you will eventually get taken advantage of. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, if you would, in verse uh, 15. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15. He says, he that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. So the safest thing is not to co-sign at all. That's the safest thing that you could do as far as business is concerned. Just keep yourself out of the business of standing up for someone else and being a surety or a co-signer as we would say, that's probably a term that we would use today as the Bible says surety here. So if you co-sign or pledge yourself to something with another you don't really know, you will eventually uh, get taken care of. Now understand Proverbs is general advice. And this is something that we find many Christians 
uh, not really understanding general advice. And because something doesn't happen every time we engage in an activity, we may have the tendency to think that it's not really a big deal or that that's not something that's real important. You may co-sign for someone or several someones and never get stung by it. But then there's always that one time. And so that's what the general advice is. It says, if you hate suretyship, then you're going to be okay. If you never co-sign, you'll never get burned. You'll never get taken care of. You'll never have another creditor knock on your door and say, hey, so-and-so didn't pay their bill, but you co-signed, so now I'm coming to you and I want to take your coat or your car or your house or I want to empty your bank account because of their disobedience and not keeping their word. And so God has some great advice for us. And so don't think, though, that you and I can violate scriptural principles on an ongoing basis and somehow not get burned by it somewhere along the line. And so here Solomon is talking to his son and saying, son, be careful about this. Be careful if you do it to a friend, but you need to understand you do it for a stranger, you're going to end up getting burned here. And so you keep your word, but understand others may not be men or women of integrity like you are to be. And so if you co-sign or pledge yourself to something with another you don't really know, you will eventually be uh, taken advantage of. So here's encouragement number one. If you do not co-sign or pledge or promise, you will not have to worry about getting stuck with a debt or losing any friendship. Remember, the relationship is important. Encouragement number two. The Christian way is to give expecting no return. If you have the ability to give, once you establish an expectation, you set up the potential for the ruination of the relationship. And as I said earlier, relationship is more important than money. And yet there have been relationships that have just gone into the trash because of the money aspect of things. And so the Christian though, if you are, if somebody comes to you in a legitimate need, personally, then you have the wherewithal to give, you give. Uh, but you don't expect something in return. Uh, if you can't afford to give, then you don't give. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And I say number three, if a person becomes a co-signer for his friend, he sets himself up for conflict and the potential to add to the poverty of his own family. Okay, let me read that again. If a person becomes a co-signer for his friend, he sets himself up for conflict and the potential to add to the poverty of his own family. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. And let's look at verse 18. The Bible says these words. A man void of understanding striketh hands and become a surety in the presence of his friend. Okay. Uh, a man void of understanding striketh hands. That's making the promise. Uh, we would say today, let's shake on it. And uh, it used to be that a man's handshake would be his bond, but not anymore. Because so many people did not honor the handshake. It used to be somebody's word would be enough. But then people didn't honor their word. So now that's why we have all the paperwork that we have when we go to borrow uh, money for whatever. And so it's so important for us to understand that when we set ourselves up as a co-signer, we can come into conflict because uh, that person, due to circumstances possibly beyond their own control, things may happen. There may be a downturn in the economy. And what happens is you get stuck with the debt as well. And then your own family is hurt because you're having to take care of somebody else's obligations. Number four, if you are providing a service with a person of unsure morals or one you do not know well, you may want to take collateral. This is, imp this is uh, interesting to me. In Proverbs chapter 27, let's go there. Proverbs chapter 27 and look at verse 13. I also find it interesting that throughout this book, these themes don't just, they're not just handled in one particular section. They seem to crop up in several places. But in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 13, the Bible says these words, take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. 
And what it means here is that there comes a point in time where if you are going to loan something to some individual, that you may need to take something of equal value. So if they don't meet that obligation, you have something of like value. So if you are providing a service with a person of unsure morals or one you do not know well, you may want to take collateral. Now let me just say, some people uh, teach that you should never co-sign. I don't believe that the scriptures say that you should never co-sign, but I do believe that the safest approach is never co-sign. And the Bible's clear about that. But it also says that if you do co-sign, you need to count the cost. And so you and I need to count that cost. Lastly, under this section, as believers, we are to be uh, gracious and giving people without jeopardizing our own family. As believers, we are, uh, excuse me, as believers, we are to be a gracious and giving people without jeopardizing our own family. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 23. And here in the book of Deuteronomy, several laws are being laid out for the children of Israel. And if you get to chapter 23, I want us to read two verses of scripture. And it's a, they equal a, a one paragraph here. It says here, thou shalt not lend upon usury, that's interest, to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now let's go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, when we think of Luke chapter, chapter 6, we usually just quote one verse, and that's verse 38. But I want to pick up the reading here, right here in uh, verse 27 of Luke 6. And this is Jesus speaking here. Of course, it's his word. He speaks every word, but here if you have a red letter edition. <laughs> It says, but I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Now, when we're talking about this, and the Bible is addressing this, it doesn't mean that you give in to the every desire of your enemy, every desire of your neighbor, it's talking about a true need that someone has. You know, and so that means that you may have to do a little bit of investigation as to whether someone has a true need or not. Um, I can remember here at the church where we had someone come by the church and they were, they were uh, saying that they had need. And I, I remember we put them up, this is in the early days of the church, we put them up in one of the local hotels and I sent a man over there after a while and to uh, go visit this guy. And as uh, he was walking in, two other preachers from the community were walking out of the hotel and come to find out this guy had just come to town, went into a hotel and he started giving everybody a sob story but he called every church in town. So he got a free night from our church, and then he got a couple of free nights from a couple of the other churches. When he used up all the churches around here that he could get a handout from and free meals, he just went down to the hotel in Morden there, right there on First Street, and he started doing the same thing. Come to find out, 
He started in southern Ontario. He got caught in Alberta somewhere because he just kept going from town to town to town to town, giving a sob story, and he was living pretty high on the hog, so to speak, taking advantage of folks. So the Bible's not talking about just giving out your money because somebody comes for a handout. Uh, one thing that we do here, I remember Brother Gary knows this. We had a lady who says uh, that she wanted to see me because uh, I was an easy touch for, for money. If I had money in my pocket and, and uh, she had a need, I, I would give her the money. You know? And finally I said, I can't do this. And so uh, she came and wanted to know where I was. And this is when my office was on the second floor in uh, the educational building there. And uh, Brother uh, Drieger said, uh, you know, Pastor Solomon's not going to give you any money. And she said, oh, yeah, he will. And so what happened was, is I come walking out of my office to go teach Sunday school, and she cornered me, and I had $20 in my pocket, and I gave her the $20, and she came downstairs and went like this with the $20 right in front of Brother Drieger's face and said, see, I got it. So, uh, I, you know, being such an easy uh, touch, I remember sitting with the deacons one night and I said, deacons, I'm too easy of a touch when they stop by. And so we have two men that handle all of our benevolent needs. And I praise the Lord for John Wolf and for Steve Freud because they will check out the legitimacy of the needs. And we have people calling the church and they want this or that, or they give the poor sob story and then they'll check the backstory. And they'll check also, as the uh, Bible says, that if people have relatives that could take care of that need in 1 Timothy, they ought to be the ones to shoulder the, uh, shoulder the burden and not the local church. And so you and I have to be careful when we let our hearts get in the way of what the scriptures say. And so there's just a lot of safety net that God has built into his word if we listen. If we listen, so uh, be careful of the judgments you make. As the scripture says, make sure you make righteous judgment. It's so easy at times to say, oh, so and so, so poor. And really, you know, they may, they may misspend their money on one thing and then ask you for a, a need that they truly may have, but it's because of their abuse over here that now they're wanting you to take up that slack. And what they need is to get right with the Lord in that matter. Amen. They may need to suffer the consequences of their act and so on. And so you and I need to understand these principles. And that's why Solomon once again is saying, son, I'm trying to teach you some things here. Please pay attention. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to our text passage here. Our text passage of Proverbs chapter six. And now we deal with the subject of laziness, laziness in verses six to 11. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and they want, and I want as an armed man. The letter A, God hates laziness. God hates laziness. And of course, Hebrews chapter five talks about being a dull hearer. And when the time came or comes for you to what? You receive that truth, you're to teach that truth. And yet if we're not careful, we become lazy where we have to be taught those same truths over and over and over again. And so when we talk about the workplace, when we talk about life, then we ought to be an industrious people. We ought not be lazy. And so here he's saying, look, go to the ant, consider her ways. Just watch the ant. I mean, they don't waste their time. They're always busy. They're doing what needs to be done. They're storing up for the winter, so to speak. And so God hates laziness. This is a trend that many, I would say, in full-time service have to watch. And I would consider me in full-time service. Many in the world see preachers as lazy people. That's a sad indictment on, on the ministry. But I remember when we started the church here at Pemina Valley and we lived on, over on Parmount Bay and we lived in one of those side-by-sides there. And I can remember our van was parked in the driveway. I, I had our house 
uh, my office there in the basement of the house. And at that time, our midweek service was on Thursday nights. And so we would rent the upstairs meeting room of the Winkler Arena on Sunday morning, Sunday night. But then on the midweek, we would actually have the midweek Bible study in the basement of our house there. And uh, I got to thinking about that all day long, people would see my van sitting in the doorway, the driveway doorway, <laughs> hopefully not the doorway, but uh, sitting there in the driveway. And I, I said, you know, I, I need to get up and get going. And so that they see that I'm not a lazy preacher. And so what I did is I got up and I went to Al's restaurant where uh, the, their CWE Medical Center is. There used to be a restaurant there. And uh, that's where I would go and sit with the older men and drink coffee with them and be lazy. No. <laughs> and I would chat with them and get to know them. And, and uh, we had many of our first contacts for the start of the church was because of me going to Al's restaurant and talking with the uh, gentleman there. In fact, one of the first marriage counseling sessions I was able to have with someone's family was because I met the dad there in the coffee shop. And he said, I wish somebody could help my son who's going through some marriage difficulty. And I remember taking my gospel tract and I said, here's my tract. And I said, if I can help him, have him give me a call. And then that dad called me uh, a couple, about two, three days later. And uh, I was able to set up a meeting and I met that son and we're able to help. In fact, that, that uh, man's daughter trusted Jesus Christ as her personal savior. And so you just never know, but I was just concerned that people would look at us as being lazy. And uh, God hates laziness. Our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's uh, ever faithful. And uh, of course, we need to sleep and all that. Don't misquote me now. But at the same time, we ought to be busy about our Father's business. Amen? And so God hates laziness. And he's, uh, Solomon is telling his, his son, hey, don't be lazy. And because you have position, because you may have resources, uh, you ha may have that tendency just to relax. You may have that tendency just to uh, just uh, enjoy the fruit of your labor, uh, you know, too long, too much. And uh, here the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. You, you uh, don't be lazy. You go to the ant and see that she's always uh, busy, okay? And so let her be a lazy man always waits for ideal conditions, good weather, and the perfect opportunity. A lazy man always waits for ideal conditions, good weather, and the perfect opportunity. So if you wait for that, you'll never do anything. Uh, there's, uh, uh, one of these things just doesn't work out all the time, right? Letter C, poverty is the lazy man's reward. It is expensive to be lazy. Their desire is that of a thief and their expenses are like those who travel. And that's what it means here at the end where it says in verse 11, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And so uh, a lazy person always wants more. They, they want this, they want that, and they're gonna work for this and they're gonna work for that, but yet they never work for this or that. They don't do anything. They're waiting for that perfect opportunity. Or they go for this get rich quick thing or that get rich quick thing or that. And, uh, and, 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 and that's just a violation of scriptural principle. And it says, and I want as an armed man. Now we just took a trip not too long ago, Brenda and I, and you know what? It's expensive traveling. It's expensive to eat out. It's, gas is expensive. Hotels are expenses, expensive. And so it says here, and it says, thy poverty uh, come as one that traveleth. So the Lord knows what he's talking about, amen? That's an understatement. Okay, so poverty is the lazy man's reward. Okay, the next point, uh, Roman number number three, is verses 12 to 15 here of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs uh, 6. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 6, 12 to 15. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken. This is a wicked person with righteous judgment. 
judgment. We're going to spend some more time uh, talking about the froward mouth as we go through the book of Proverbs. I'll probably take a whole lesson and just talk about the froward mouth, the naughty person. Roman number number four, abominations. I would encourage you, I preached a message years ago on abomination. Abomination, if you use the law of first mention, it really has to do with that which God detests, what he hates, and it's tied with a person's morals. And so God hates some things, and they're an abomination to him. And he mentions these in this, in this passage of Scripture. These six things, verse 16, doth the Lord hate. It says, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Here are seven things that are disgusting to God. Think about these as we just lightly run through uh, these definitions here about these abominations. These are things that God hates. Folks, he loves all sin. So the problem is interesting that God mentions that first. Let her be a lying tongue. That is deceitful and deceptive speech. Deceitful and deceptive speech. Okay, let her see. Hands that shed innocent blood. That's a murderer. Hands that shed innocent blood. That's a murderer. Let me just uh, take a little bit of a caveat here. We need to be praying for the United States in this whole thing before the Supreme Court with the abortion that the state of Mississippi is bringing forward. And uh, we need to be praying that the Supreme Court rules right in that matter. You say, well, they ought to outlaw it altogether. Yes, they should. But I tell you what, even if they bring it on down to 15 weeks or 12 weeks, that is a good start from what's been taking place there since the 70s, Roe versus Wade. And so we need to be praying for them in that. And we, need to, we have it on our prayer sheet as well to pray about this abortion. That's because abortion is murder. And uh, people don't like you using that terminology and accusing them as such, but that's exactly what the Bible says it is. And so uh, I, I, many times, in fact, when my wife and I were traveling this week, we, uh, I think she mentioned, she said, you know, it's a wonder that God has withheld his judgment in North America. Maybe what we're going through is a partial judgment. We know there's a lot more to come, but I tell you what, we need to stand against abortion. God is for life. Did you hear that? God is for life. Okay? And so we need to be praying. God hates murder. God hates it. Okay? Uh, letter D, a heart that deviseth wicked imagination is one who plans evil and wicked purposes. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, one who plans evil and wicked purposes. So if you're with a group of friends and they want to go out and do something mischievous and something wrong, you need to understand God hates that. God hates that. Young people, God hates that. He hates it. Okay? It's an abomination to him. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, one who plans evil and wicked purposes. Letter E, a false witness. It's a promise breaker. Does not keep his vows. Okay? God hates it when you don't keep your word. So what's one of the main lessons that we're getting here from Proverbs chapter 6? Keep your word. Keep your word. Keep your word. Letter F, feet that be swift in running to mischief is one who is quick to run toward evil, always drawn to evil. Always drawn to evil. Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation... Also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. And so you don't have to do evil. And if you are ever with people who have that tendency to always go that direction, change company. Because evil communications, 1 Corinthians 15, evil communications corrupt good manners. You might be a fine individual now, but you hang with the wrong crowd and they will corrupt you. 
they will corrupt you. I mean, I can remember when I was growing up, uh, I remember that uh, I had my mouth washed out with, with soap. My mom didn't just, you know, take, a, take her hand with some soap in it. She would take a washcloth. She would soak that thing and she would lather that thing up and it would go in my mouth. And she would cram that thing in my mouth to teach me a lesson. So I had one of the cleanest mouths in town. But I tell you what, you know, that, that I needed to watch uh, my mouth. And you and I need to do the same. Amen? And so then we see here uh, letter G. And lastly, boy, did I chase a rabbit there. Okay. Soweth discord among the brethren. That's one who is always causing contention and strife. Soweth discord among the brethren. You see, because one of the things that ought to be a hallmark of the church of Jesus Christ is our unity. Should be our unity. And so the devil... One of his chief tools is to try to cause discord and have someone uh, so, so uh, discord or disunity uh, in the body. And so it says, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. And so only by pride cometh contention. So you see how all this is intertwined here. And so God is giving uh, us some great admonition in this chapter and we Barely have touched on some of this subject matter, but these things, especially these seven things that make for an abomination that, that uh, God uh, detests, are things that we're going to see as a recurring theme throughout uh, this particular book.